Uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Michelle Bell Boissier. I am a longtime New Orleanian and a longtime faculty member in the biology department at Xavier University in Louisiana. Um, and at the moment, I am serving as head of that department. What I'm here to do today is to give you an introduction to genetics. Yes, this is a science class. No, there's no test at the end. Um, but it is an in introduction to genetics for people who are interested in family history, people who are amateur, or perhaps more than amateur, uh, genealogists. So, who am I? My family has lived in southeast Louisiana on my mom's side since the 1740s, so we're coming up on 300 years, right? Um, and on my dad's side in the city of New Orleans since at least 1800, so I'm a multi-generational um, stereotyped Louisiana black Creole. Um, again, as I just mentioned, I am also a genetics professor, have been for 30 years now. So that combination of information and my own just general interest in all things that are historical um, means the field of genetic genealogy, which is what we're going to discuss today, is of particular interest to me. So my goal is to assist people who don't have a strong background in biology in general or in genetics in particular, who are now using some type of genetic analysis in their family history. I hope by the end of this morning's presentation, you'll have just enough information on um, biology genetics to help you to understand the results you get from your ancestry or 23 and the analyses. So, genetics, basic definition, Genetics is that scientific study of how physical characteristics, your eye color, your height, the way your pancreas functions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, how physical characteristics in any living organism is passed, inherited, how it's used, right? There are a couple of different branches of genetics. One of the three major branches of genetics is what we call classical genetics, sometimes referred to as Mendelian genetics. Um, so, in classical genetics, you're analyzing the frequency, the rate at which a certain physical characteristic is passed from one generation to the next. You might remember in your high school or college biology class doing Mendel's Punnett squares on the green pea plant, right? Well, the principles that Mendel described on the green pea plants he was using apply to every living organism, including the physical characteristics in us. Okay? One of the things that's done as a part of classical genetics is constructing pedigree charts. Okay? And you look at a pedigree chart, the frequency of who in which generation gets a certain characteristic. So pedigree charts are standard part of classical genetics. In contemporary or molecular genetics, we kind of turn away from looking at big picture what's passed from one generation to the next, and we turn our attention to the individual molecules that are responsible for producing those characteristics. So the molecule that you've all heard of is deoxyribonucleic acid, also known as DNA. All right, genealogy, as I'm sure you all know, is traditionally doing a family lineage. You look at historical records, you look at historical interviews, and in genealogy, you start to see extended family relationships over a period of several generations. So genealogy is giving you a picture of your place in your family's history and a picture of your place in history in general. In genealogy, we all know, we do family tree charts, right? You can drop family tree charts to give this kind of big picture overview of all of the work that you've done in terms of looking at the historical records. Contemporary genealogy often includes getting a DNA analysis done to help you figure out which genes you share with other individuals. Well, there's a perfect fit between the science of genetics and the history of genealogy, right? Most scientific disciplines don't really spend a whole lot of time thinking about history, thinking about the past. But genetics can't be done 
without thinking about history, thinking about who the ancestors were. Okay? And the family tree that is routinely used in genealogy is exactly the same as the pedigree chart that is routinely used in genetics. So this is an example of a family tree, right, where you have the names of each of the people in the different generations. You show who's married to who or who's reproducing to whom, right, and who the offspring are. So this is a family tree for genealogy. And this is a pedigree chart for genetics. It's the same, the exact same thing. So there is a natural, if somebody wants this chair, feel free. Oh, there's not, yeah, is there a chair? There, there's this one, but feel free to sit there if somebody would like to. Um, so there's a natural connection between the old fashioned genetics, the classical genetics, and the old fashioned things that are done in um, family histories. But in the contemporary analysis of what your genes are for family history, and the contemporary analysis of um, DNA molecules and chromosomes, we also have another place where today those things are connecting and overlapping, interacting with each other. So if you are using genetic analysis in your family history, how do you understand the results that you are receiving? Okay. So, a couple of concepts in genetics, again, that there is no test at the end. Um, deoxyribonucleic acid, also known as DNA, is present in every single cell in every living organism. It's critical, what is it doing, right? If it's in every cell, clearly it's important. So the job of DNA, DNA is used to direct the functions that the cell can perform, direct what process the cells undergo, direct what process um, every individual cell is going to make, uh, do every protein it's going to make, every enzyme it's going to make, how it's going to grow, how long that cell is going to last, etc., etc. right? In addition to that important role of telling the rest of the cell what to do, DNA is also the only portion of any cell that's passed to the next generation. So whether you're talking about when your skin cells make more skin cells, it's the DNA that is passed to the next generation, but also when we, as living organisms, reproduce. It is the DNA in our cells that we directly pass to our offspring, and it is the DNA in our parents' cells that was directly passed to us. Okay? Deoxyribonucleic acid. <laughs> it just rolls off the top. Um, okay. So, the DNA in our cells is packaged into chromosomes. Those chromosomes are contained within the nucleus of the cell. Well, as humans, we possess a total of 46 chromosomes in each of our cells, right? 44 of those we call autosome chromosomes, and males and females have the exact same kinds of autosomes. Two of those, 46, are called our sex determination chromosomes. And so males and females don't get the exact same composition of sex determination chromosomes, right? Um, males get one X chromosome from their mother and one Y chromosome from their father. Females receive an X chromosome from the mother and an X chromosome from the father. No, we expected there to All right. So, among our 44 autosomes, it's not 44 different autosomes with 44 different sets of genes on them, but instead, among our 44 autosomes, there are 22 different types, okay? So you get two copies of chromosome number one, and two copies of chromosome number two, and two copies of chromosome number 17, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The reason we are getting two copies of each of those autosomes is because you're getting one copy of each from each of your parents. So you've got a chromosome number one from your mother and a chromosome number one from your father. Perfectly matched is the way the way it functions, the way it functions for balance and proper function. Okay. Um, as I just mentioned, the two sex determination chromosomes, females will receive an X from the mother and an X from the father. Males will receive an X from the mother and then a Y from the father. All right, and these are just um, pictures of what we call karyotypes. So these are chromosomes 
These are actual human chromosomes. In our cells, no, they aren't that colorful and pretty. Um, but these are actual human chromosomes that have been stained with fluorescent dyes so that they are more colorful and easier to match the two in the cell that are both carrying the genes that we call chromosome number one, okay? In addition to the fact that they aren't that pretty in real time in any of our cells, they're also not that cooperative and orderly. So a microbiologist, a geneticist, had to stain the chromosomes, look at them under a microscope, and then take pictures of them and move them around and line them up to look like this. All right. So how do we pass genes to new generations? Well, during reproduction, each parent gives the offspring 23 of the 46 possible chromosomes that we possess in each of our cells. So in a cell that we would call an egg or an ovum, that will contain 22 autosomes and one sex chromosome. So a total of 23 chromosomes in an egg. And the same is true in a sperm cell. 22 autosomes and one sex chromosome, right? So 23 is the number of chromosomes we receive from each of our parents. And 23 is the number of chromosomes we will give to each of the children that we produce, okay? So the genetic testing site that is called 23andMe, that's one. Okay. So, giving your offspring half of your chromosomes, not all of them, ensures that our offspring are not genetically identical to us. We're not cloning, right? It ensures that the next generation, when there are two parents each giving 23, the next generation also has a total of 46, which is the normal for humans. It also ensures that each child that is produced is ever so slightly different from each of their parents. And the more diversity we have in any biological species, the better it is for the long-term survival of that species, right? So, uh, the reproduction process of humans, nothing strange here. Females have 46 chromosomes total, and ovum will have 23. Males have 46 chromosomes total in each cell. A sperm will have 23, so the new cell that is produced has that 46 chromosomes, and that goes on to produce the embryo, the child, the adult. All right. Well, there are two different ways we have twins. Sometimes we have, sometimes people have twins because a female might have produced two ova in one menstrual cycle, and then there's always more than enough sperm around. Um, different topic. Um, but so it's possible to have twins so that two separate eggs were fertilized by two separate sperm. Right? Those are what we call fraternal twins. But sometimes you can have twins form because one egg was fertilized by one sperm and in the first couple of days of development, that one little teeny teeny tiny embryo split into two and each one continued the developmental process. Yes, mm -hmm. because they're gonna undergo a, um, a reproduction process of the DNA before the split happens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, just a few moments ago, I talked about the essential um, aspect of diversity, of combining genes from two parents to make an offspring, right? Um, that adds to the diversity. Another thing that adds to how unique we each are from any of our siblings, from our parents, from others in our families, we all have something about us that is unique or the combination of genes that is unique. That's because during the process of reproduction, not only are you getting 23 from one parent and 23 from another parent, making you a unique you, before you get the 23 from your mother, her chromosomes are going to attach to one another and swap little bits and pieces with each other. And then your father, before he makes the sperm that will be used to make you, his chromosomes are also going to line up with each other and exchange little bits and pieces with each other. So actually, the chromosomes that I received from my mother are slightly different than the way they existed in her, right? So pieces from her mother and her father 
exchanged places with each other before she gave 23 chromosomes to me. So that adds another layer of diversity, of having slight differences in our composition of genes. Each generation, we continue to add another layer of different compositions in the genes that we are passing. All right. So that process that I'm demonstrating there is called crossing over. Um, again, absolutely critical. It's actually very difficult to produce a healthy egg or a healthy sperm if that crossing over doesn't occur. So this is a really important part of that reproductive process of getting genes to the next generation. Okay. So, as I said, the chromosomes I got from my mother and the chromosomes that I got from my father, shown here in this picture, um, <laughs> shuffled and exchanged pieces with one another before I made an ovum to produce my son. That is a very, very old picture. I to to <laughs> um, okay, so, uh, chromosomes, DNA, and genes. So, remember, the chromosomes in our cells are composed of that molecule DNA. DNA, this is really critical for understanding the testing that we have done, uh, the genetic testing that we have done for ancestry. DNA is really a complex molecule, okay? It is made of billions, with a B, not millions, billions with a B, subunits that we call nucleotides. And those billions of subunits are linked to one another end to end to form long, long chains, okay? There are only four different kinds of nucleotides, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. But we have billions and billions and billions of them in some special and unique to you order of A's and T's and G's and C's. So the order of A, T, G, and C that is present in your chromosomes, you and only you have, okay? That's what the genetic testing sites are looking for. What is the order of nucleotides that are present in your cells? Okay? Um, a little subunit of your DNA that serves one purpose or makes one protein for you, that's what we call a gene. The totality of all of the genes and nucleotides that you possess, that is what we call our genome. <laughs> so, in the 1990s, a new technique for analyzing DNA was developed. People had been analyzing DNA for about 20 or 30 years prior to this, but it was slow, it was hard, it was inaccurate, and it was expensive. Okay? But in the 1990s, a new technique for DNA analysis was developed that made it more accurate, took less time, <laughs> Easier to do, therefore, less expensive, okay? So, as a result of that technique, scientists were able to do the Human Genome Project, which basically was an analysis of kind of a reference or framework genome for kind of what is a standardized human genome, right? Well, as it turns out, with all those billions of nucleotides that we have, I have your 98, but the truth is it's 99% of all of our nucleotides in this room and everywhere else on the planet. If you are human, 99% of your nucleotides are the same as everybody else's. Okay? If 99% are the same, how can we be so different? Bottom line, simplest way to describe how we can be so different when 99% of our DNA is the same is because the 1% that is unique in us, the 1% about the order of our nucleotides that is really unique to us, is also the 1% that we use the most to function, our, to develop our bodies for ourselves to function, so, okay? So, small percentage of the DNA nucleotides is truly unique. Small percentage of the nucleotides are really, really, really used. <laughs> And that's the same percentage. So that's how we get all the different characteristics that we do. All right. So for $100, $150, still, it's not possible to analyze billions of nucleotides. So 
the genetic testing that most of us have done, again, through Ancestry, 23andMe, MyHeritage, whatever site you use, is not analyzing every single nucleotide that you possess. That will cost well over $1,000, okay? And that isn't really widely available to the public anyway. So ancestral DNA testing is not testing every nucleotide. It is looking for short segments that are unique. Okay? Those short segments that are really unique and not found in every body are called single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. Right? So what the ancestry testing is doing, it's looking at your SNPs. So not all of your nucleotides, just a little subset of your nucleotides, the ones that seem to be the most unique among people, the most reflective of what your ancestry is, and what your health predispositions are, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? That one percent is you and just you. Mm -hmm. The rest of it, everybody got it. Yeah. It's the one percent that makes us special. Yeah. Okay. So the more SNPs that you have in common with someone, the more closely related you are to that person. All right? So when you see on these sites about someone's predicted to be a sibling or a second cousin or a fifth cousin, the fifth cousin has a very small number of SNPs in common with you. The sibling or the first cousin has a very large number of SNPs in common with you. So the ancestry services are actually assessing your SNPs, looking at whose SNPs you share in common, and looking at where those SNPs have been found over the last several hundred years. That's how they can make predictions about where your ancestors lived over the last several hundred years. Um, analyzing the SNPs in an individual has lots and lots of important um, applications. So not just for genealogy, for healthcare, analyzing SNPs is critical. It can predict which diseases you are more likely to get. It can predict which kinds of medications are more likely to work in you. It can predict which kinds of medications are more likely to give you really negative side effects, right? Um, analyzing DNA on someone is also critical for crime solving. You know, we've all watched SVU or Law and Order, et cetera, et cetera, CSI. Okay. So it's impossible to accurately discuss the biology and history that is genealogy without ignoring geography. Now, I don't really know anything about geography, but I'm going to show you a world map in a minute. Um, okay. And the reason I say that is because when you do DNA analysis for genealogy purposes, you can't ignore geography because it is a biological but also a geographical study, right? The analyses tell you, oh, your ancestors lived in this place and in that place and in this place. So geography also plays in, you know, an indirect or perhaps a direct role because what they're looking at is where are those SNPs most commonly found, right? So if your DNA sample has lots and lots of SNPs that are really frequently found in people of Asian descent, and almost never found in people of African descent or North American descent, then that's how they draw the conclusion that you must have Asian ancestry because your SNPs are almost exclusively found in people from Asia. Okay? But I also ask you to understand when you read your ancestry results, the Wright brothers did not invent migration. In other words, there are some places where people were able to migrate long before there was modern travel, okay? So, if I look at this map of the world, sometimes ancestry tests will tell you that X percent um, French heritage, X percent German, her German heritage. Take that with a grain of salt. Because today, and 500 years ago, if you wanted to walk from France to Germany, you could. Right? Now, if they tell you you have X percent Northern European in general and X percent African in general, today you can take a flight from point A to point B and mate with whomever you choose. But 500 years ago, that was a lot harder um, journey. So, 
big picture bottom line here, the percentages that the ancestry testing services tell you about continent to continent are pretty accurate. The percentages they tell you about, you know, bordering countries with, you know, for which there is no real hard to cross barrier, those are certainly less accurate, right? It's like saying, well, you have, if they would say something as ridiculous as you have X percent um, Louisiana and X percent Mississippi, they can't tease that apart, right? So they can't tease apart France and Germany, they can't tease apart Spain and Portugal, but perhaps they can tease apart France and Spain because of the mountain range that is in between them. That was an impediment to, you know, you have to be in the same space with someone to reproduce them. So, all right. Um, all of the major uh, DNA testing companies use pretty much the same set of one million SNPs. So remember, we have billions of nucleotides. They are looking at about a million SNPs, and pretty much the same SNPs are used by Ancestry, by all the other testing companies, by 23andMe, right? The difference in results, and I know a couple of people who've had tests done by multiple testing services, the difference in results is not because they're looking at different SNPs. It's because each of those companies has their own team of bioinformatics specialists who are basically mathematicians who look at biological data, right? So each company has its own set of calculations to make predictions about what your ancestry is. So each company has their own mathematical formulas to make those predictions, and that's where you start to see discrepancies in the data from one company to another. Obviously, those companies are run by humans, and so we all sometimes make mistakes, but more often than not, there's a lot of accuracy to what, to what they're telling you if you are, know how to interpret it properly, right? Um, but none of the math mathematical formulas is accurate beyond the third cousin range. So if 23andMe tells you you have a sibling or a first cousin you didn't know about, that is probably true. Whether that makes you happy or sad, that's probably true, right? But if 23 and then it tells you you have a fourth cousin or a fifth cousin, and it's going to tell you you have a hundred thousand fourth and fifth cousins, right? You know, maybe you could accidentally share a half a percentage DNA with somebody. That could be a coincidence. But it's not a coincidence if you have 10% DNA in common with somebody, right? Okay. So, um, you know, the closer the relationship that is predicted, the more likely that is accurate and truthful. The further away the relationship that is predicted, the less likely that is accurate or truthful. Um, some of you, anybody here had testing done with 23andMe? All right. So 23andMe typically gives people um, also haplotype information. Does anybody remember seeing that word haplotype in the results? Okay. So not all of the companies use haplotype information, but some of them do. Um, because some of them do, and it's one of the popular ones, I thought I should address that. So, a haplotype is a collection of SNPs that doesn't undergo that crossing over exchange. Okay? All right. So, my daughter, uh, no, not necessarily. No, the haplotype is a little bit different from this. So, we talked about the crossing over, the exchange of maternal and paternal, your mother and father's genes in you before you reproduce. Okay, your Y chromosome can't exchange with any other chromosome because men have one Y chromosome. So, there's no crossing over occurring there. So, if you follow the SNPs on a Y chromosome, that remains pretty unchanged for hundreds and hundreds of years. So for men, a Y chromosome haplotype is a great way to trace where your father, father's father, father's father, paternal all the way, okay? 